Hey, everyone, and welcome to The Difference, a podcast highlighting leaders who are making a difference in their teams and their stores and their communities. I'm Alexis Whaley. And I'm Drew Holler. Hey, Drew. So uh, who who did we just get done talking to? Jordan Weber. Uh, Jordan uh, was an Olympian in, t- in 2012. Uh, she won a gold medal in gymnastics um, at the age of 14. She's now 25, and she coaches. She's the head coach of the University of Arkansas gymnastics team. We had a great conversation. I was thoroughly impressed with her. Yeah. Um, not just what she's accomplished, but really how she approaches her job as a coach. She talks about making a difference in people's lives. She talks about setting goals, all of these things that we talk about as being leaders at Walmart. Uh, and it was so very similar to what we do, uh, which was yeah. great to hear her perspective. Uh, but she's clearly making a difference in her athletes' lives. Uh, and she wants to make a difference uh, even broader than that as well, and I'm sure she will. Uh, so I'm really anxious for everybody to hear. So this is you know, just a great opportunity for everybody to take a listen uh, to somebody who's achieved a lot in their, her own life but then also now it's pouring into others, uh, being a leader and being a coach. So hopefully you guys get something out of this, uh, but it was a great and special moment for us. Yes, absolutely. Can't wait for you to watch. All right, let's go. So um, one of the things I thought we'd get into is, uh, I know we'll talk a little bit about gymnastics and how you how you got started, which I know you've talked a lot about. We've watched a lot of your stuff already, but. Uh, it'd be interesting just for uh, those that are listening to hear your story. And you know, I know you started at a very early age uh, in gymnastics, but then um, you led into uh, obviously the Olympics. And what I really want to talk to you about is your coaching uh, experience. But if you want to, if you could just tell us a little bit about how you started in gymnastics in, in uh, the very early years. Yeah. So I was, I was born into a very athletic family. My mom runs marathons. Uh, mm-hmm. my dad, you know, was, was pretty athletic and, and all my siblings did sports as well. My older sister does marathons. So, um, mm-hmm. it was just sort of natural that I was going to be some kind of athlete. Um, and then when I was a toddler, like two or three years old, my parents noticed that I already at that young of age had these little, like mini biceps and quad <laughs> muscles. And I was really muscular just naturally. And so they looked at me and said, well, she kind of already looks like a gymnast. Let's put her in and see if, if it works out. Uh, so that's literally how I started gymnastics. Um, wow. And then, you know, for any kid who's ever done a gymnastics class, you walk in, you see the foam pin, the trampoline. And it's like, yeah, sure. Um, so that's like what initially drew me to the sport. And then, um, you know, because I had a muscular build, I was always really strong, which really helped me excel quickly in the early uh, stages of gymnastics. Um, and then, um, by the time I was eight years old, I was already doing two a day practices, um, wow. the U S national team at age 10, which, um, is crazy just to even say, um, and then competed internationally on the national team for, um, you know, seven, seven years. And then, you know, eventually made the Olympics, but it's just, I just loved, I loved the sport. I loved being in the gym every day. It was not easy by any means. And there were mm. some really tough days, a lot of two a day practices, just exhausted all the time. Um, but at the end of the day, I loved competing and I love mm. um, the challenge of learning new skills and mastering my routines and figuring out a way to be better one day than I was the day before. And that's kind of how I live my daily life now that I'm not a mm. gymnast, but that's, that's what kept me in it um, through those hard days. I was just so passionate about the sport and I still love it enough to, to do, spend the rest of my life doing it apparently. So, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so that's sort of how I got started and how it wow. happened. How does that motivation, you know, I, uh, when I think back and I was 12, uh, I wasn't particularly motivated. Nothing compared, <laughs> compared to that. What, what, st- what, what probably drove you to be that focused and wanting to, to improve each and every day? What, is there something in your life? Is it your parents? Is it just the way you were? What was that motivation factor for you? Yeah, I think it was a combination of a lot of things. You know, my, my parents are extremely hardworking and they always have mm-hmm. been. So that was kind of in st- that hard work quality was really instilled in me from a young sure. age. Um, but I've also always been a goal oriented person. I love mm. goals. I love setting them. I, if you know anything about the Enneagram, I'm an Enneagram three. Ah, um, so am I. Three so it's true. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. Just are, a few threes talking to yeah, each other. Just, yeah. Yeah. We're all, we're all, we're all, uh, we're all thinking about the things we should be doing right now to achieve something. Right. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and wondering what you're thinking of me and what I'm thinking. Yeah. Of yeah, yeah. Am I performing right? <laughs> 
Um, anyway, so I love goals, um, because I'm at three. And, um, so having, you know, from, from the time I was nine years old, when I first watched the Olympics on TV, it was the 2004 Olympics. And I saw Carly Patterson win the all around, uh, from that moment I had in my mind that my goal was to be an Olympian mm -hmm. and wow. I didn't necessarily think about it every day or like I didn't walk in the gym saying, okay, now I have to work one step closer to making the Olympics. Yeah. It was always small goals along the way, but having that, that goal in the back of my mind constantly is, is really what motivated me, especially through the hard times. Um, and then, you know, there, obviously there was a long journey to get to the Olympics. So just having, um, just taking it one goal at a time, but having really hefty goals, um, mm. is something that, you know, even when I couldn't make my beam routine all day or, mm. um, my coach was upset with me or whatever was happening. Yeah. It's just, I always woke up the next morning thinking, okay, like today's going to be better and mm. I'm going to get one step closer to my goals. And for me, that was so powerful. Wow. Yeah. My, my nephew's a three and he's a high, high performing, very high performing guy. And, um, I told him, you know, pre be prepared of never being satisfied. <laughs> That's the good thing and the bad thing about being a three. Uh, you, you never are satisfied. Um, that's cool. So uh, obviously uh, had a great career in gymnastics, uh, one for the ages. You know, people would say that uh, even by the age of 14, you'd achieved more than what, what most people uh, would have achieved uh, in their lives. And just what an um, amazing feat that was. What, uh, what I thought would be interesting to talk about is, you know, after that happened, after you win the gold and um, you, you now transition probably more to a collegi collegiate career, mm -hmm. um, what was that like? What was that transition from like 14 to the time you entered college and mm -hmm. uh, probably had to think through, you know, is this something that I want to do? Is this going to be one of my life goals? What was that transition? It's hard to, it's hard to max that peak, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think any Olympian who retires will yeah. tell you that you kind of go through this identity crisis sure. um, because you, you feel like, at least I felt like I had reached this peak of my life. I'm like, what more mm. can I accomplish that's bigger and better than the Olympics? You know, what is after the Olympics? Um, I think every Olympian goes through that. Um, sure. and I sure did. Um, but I, um, so I actually went professional in the sport, you know, right before the Olympics, um, and when you go professional, you obviously give up your eligibility to compete in college. Okay. Um, and at that time I was committed to go to UCLA to be a uh, college. And so I called the, the head coach at UCLA and said, you know, I, I'm, I'm having this dilemma. I really want to compete in college, but I also want to take advantage of these opportunities that I have and, um, and go on post-Olympic tours and do endorsements sure. and commercials yeah. and all that. It was just so cool. Um, and so she said, you know, you can still come to UCLA. You're already into the school and you can be involved with the team without Got competing. It. And so I said, great. She said, okay, you're going to be a team manager. And I'm like, awesome. Cool. <laughs> and I show up on campus, not knowing what team managers do. I'm like, yeah. All right, I'm a team manager. What, what am I, what's my job? And um, she's like, okay, so you're going to move the mats and you're going to make sure the bars are chalk. You're going to do their laundry and you're going to make sure that they have everything they need uh, to compete. And so here I am, like literally came sh like almost straight from the Olympics um, and showed up and I was a team manager for a college gymnastics team and wow. had retired from competition at that time. And so that's, that sort of the, was the beginning of the transition. Um, was that a little bit hit to, to the ego a little bit? Is there, or was it one, something you just want to jump in and go at it? Yeah, I think most people would think it would be a hit to yeah. the ego, but, and this is like just a little bit of a look inside my brain. Like I've always yeah. been a very team oriented person. Like mm. when I competed myself, if it was a team competition, like the, the, the team score mattered, I always performed better than if it was an individual competition, just, sure. it just happened that way. And so I've always loved, uh, just sort of a team environment. Um, and I, I strongly believe you can accomplish so much more with other people by your side than you can on your own. Sure. Um, and so when she's, said that I'm like, well, great. If this is what I can do to help the team be successful, I'm going to do it. And, um, and that was literally how I approached it. And I would literally go to the meets and, and little girls in the crowd would be like, well, there's Jordan Weaver, gold medal Olympian, and she's moving the mask. And, um, <laughs> and then the head coach said, you know, what a great example that you're setting yeah, for, sure. 
you know, for young girls and, um, to be able to, to do that without having an ego about it. That's yeah. just sort of, um, the bigger lesson behind it. But anyway, so I was a team manager for three years, mm. um, until my senior year, uh, the head coach asked me to start coaching. Um, and at the time I thought, well, I've spent my whole life in the gym. I don't plan on spending the rest of my mm. life in the gym. I don't want to coach. Um, wow. but you know, I said, and, and I was able to spend the last few years really observing like how college gymnastics operated mm. and the head coach at the time at UCLA, um, Valerie Condo Steele just had this really unique style of coaching that, um, really developed the human being that was the athlete. Um, and she coached from a completely different perspective than most of their coaches do. And, and I was really inspired by that. So I said, all right, I'm going to try this and see if I like it. Literally a month later, I'm like, this is what I want to do. Wow. And I want to coach someday. And I want to be able to impact student athletes lives mm. in this way. And we all know college is one of the most transformative yeah, times totally. in anyone's yeah. life. And that yeah. is, it's so cool to be able to work with college students every day. That's awesome. Wow. That's interesting. So um, your coach at UCLA, it's interesting that you say that um, they kind of took a holistic approach. Yeah. Um, we talk yeah. about that a little bit of as a, you know, as a leader, because coaching and, and being a leader, even in the corporate world or in, especially in stores, it's very, it's a very raw leadership and, uh, you know, kind of taking, taking care of the whole associate uh, and what we call our employees uh, is something top of mind for us. Cause we want to think of them about their well-being, we want to think about their career aspirations. We want to think about uh, how they're how they're performing, uh, and it's that kind of that coaching mentality. But what are some of the things that she did uh, that made you think of looking at the athlete holistically and making sure that they're uh, inspired and taken care of? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the number one thing that comes to mind is you know we talk about the enneagram every mm -hmm. year. We do the enneagram with our athletes, um, and I mm -hmm. love it because. A, you obviously develop a new um, sense of self-awareness when you mm -hmm. learn your Enneagram and you learn about the people around you and how to work better together as a team. But um, the reason I bring that up is because one of the things that she did was she, um, she coached them each as individuals and figured mm -hmm. out what motivates each person because it's different for everybody. Uh, uh -huh. You know, while one person needs you to say, um, Hey, I love you, whether you make this bar team or not. And the next person needs you to say, if, you know, if you don't make this bar team, you've got, um, you know, you've got 10 more and, and, mm. you know, different yeah. things motivate different people, depending on, you know, their life experiences and their personalities. Um, she had this way of coaching them all as individuals and motivating them rather than motivating change in them rather than dictating change. Mm. We've, we've learned in, in, especially in the sport of gymnastics, I'm sure it's like this in a lot of, um, more negative cultures, but, um, it's really easy to dictate change. It's easy to walk around and say, mm. do as I say, and we will win, but you don't develop a human being that way. You don't um, right. empower them to That's have right. a voice and make their own choices and be intentional. So, um, that was the number one thing I learned from her was she coached them all as individuals and, and figured out a way to motivate change rather than dictating it. Um, and it was so cool to see the way four years later, they mm. are these strong, independent, courageous women who are just ready to take on life. And, um, she really teach life lessons through sport instead of just coaching the sport. Um, it's easier to just coach the sport, but to be able to, to teach life lessons through it, um, is really powerful. And I always say when I, even when I'm talking to recruits, yeah. my passion is for helping people. And gymnastics is my best tool to be able to do that. Yeah, that's your vehicle, awesome. right? That's yeah. your vehicle to get that done. And so that's my foundation. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I developed that in part with her at UCLA and from watching what she did and it inspired me so much. Yeah, it's interesting. We, we talk a lot about empowerment and how important that is. And also as a leader, and we have leaders that are listening to this that either lead a team of five people mm -hmm. or teams of uh, hundreds, in some cases, thousands. Um, and it's all the same. Uh, no matter how many people you lead, it's about creating an environment where they can flourish. That's the job of a leader. Uh, and it's a lot easier to jump in and say, hey, go do this, go do that, be that dictator that you talked about, versus to take a little bit of a step back and create the environment and let the individual inside the team actually flourish. Um, it's, a, it's a nuance not, not everybody has. It takes a little bit more effort, takes a little bit more thought behind it, um, but it's what gets, you know, what gets the best results. Um, interesting. The, uh, 
you know, you've transitioned uh, from a player to a coach. Um, and uh, we have, uh, just to give you some history at Walmart, we just went through a, a significant change in our stores where we promoted about 100,000 people into new roles. And a lot of them are, are new to being a leader. Uh, so they may have been one of the best performers out, out on the floor, and now they have an opportunity to lead people. And that's a transition uh, where you go from uh, being the individual contributor, doing really well, top performer, to now you're leading others. How has that transition for you, how's that been for you as you train? You may still be going through that transition, but how's that transition for you been? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, it, it seems like just yesterday I was competing and, and kind of made that transition. But like I just re realized today, I'm like, I retired like 10 years ago wow. from the sport. Wow. Um, and so it feels like it's been a while since I've mm. actually you know, trained and competed myself. But at the same time, you know, in a lot of ways, I can relate to most, if not all of the obstacles and challenges that our athletes are facing on a daily mm. basis, whether it's mental health or injuries or relationships or mm. really, really anything. Um, you know, I feel like I can speak to my own experience, but also, you know, one of the, the things that hit me right in the face when I first started coaching was what worked for me is going to mm. work for one out of 16 of my student athletes. Interesting. Um, yeah. And it goes back to what I said, like everybody's motivated by different things. And same thing goes with gymnastics technique. You know, I could, I could mm. do one skill and think of it this way and feel this thing. And that won't work for anybody. And so yeah. I really had to have um, just a, a mindset of, of learning and observing and, um, you know, not just kind of take my ego out of it. You know, just because I'm an Olympian doesn't mean I know everything there is to know about gymnastics. And there's so many different ways to, to motivate people. There's so many different ways to coach a, a certain skill. Uh, so for the first, like, for the first few years I was at UCLA, I just, I asked a ton of questions. And I just really try to learn, absorb, and, and be a sponge um, to information. And I still do that now, even, even though I'm a head coach, I have assistant coaches who are really skilled and really knowledgeable about the sport. And I, and I just want to learn constantly. So um, that was one of the biggest uh, things I tried to do as I transitioned from being an athlete to a coach is just take my ego out of it mm. and open to learning and, and understanding I don't, I'm not going to know everything. Yes. Oh, that's huge. Kind of check in, checking your ego at the door is yeah. is hard, right? Um, you know, being a you know high performing individual, um, and you've kind of touched on this, but then you get into you know coaching, and not not everybody's built the same, which you mentioned, but not everybody may have the same drive that you had. Um, and uh, I mean, you were an Olympian for a reason, right? Uh, and not everybody may have that same mindset Has that, have you noticed that? Is that something that you have to keep in mind as well? Yeah, definitely. Mm. Um, you know, it, it is hard. We have myself and one of my assistant coaches is also an Olympian in men's mm. gymnastics. Wow. Um, and we often have that conversation of, you know, like when, when something makes so much sense to us, but yeah. it's not the same for somebody else, it's, it's hard. And, and one of the hardest parts about being a coach is that you can't just do it yourself. Like you, mm. you we have to figure out how to coach and motivate other people to do, to do it. Um, and we just, we all want to win so bad. And I think, you know, going back to my early days in the sport you know, through coaching and through um, just the, the system I was brought up in, I was really taught to associate winning with success. Um, mm. And that was very clear. Like there was an equal sign in between those two words when I was growing up as a gymnast and mm. because of the system I grew up in and the way my coaches, um, you know, praised me when I won and criticized me when I didn't mm. win, even if I feel like I did my best. Sure. Um, and so I really had to make that adjustment mentally when I became mm. a coach of, um, you know, just because, you know, if you don't win, you can still feel success That's right. and, and success is whatever you decided it is. It's, it's our job to, to define it. Um, and so that's been a, a huge transition becoming a coach as well. And especially, you know, dealing with, you know, the, the idea that not everybody um, has necessarily the drive. Some people might have other definitions of success. And it might be you know, having no regrets mm. at the end of the season, whether we're first or 15th, if we did everything we possibly could in order to be successful, that success. And so, um, really figuring out how to set goals with the team, defining what is going to be success for us this year, mm. with what we have, um, that's really helped with, with that piece. 
Um, but also it's, you know, it's, um, it's constantly a challenge to figure out like, how can I get, I know it's inside this person. Yeah. How can I figure out a way to bring it out of them? Cause I know it's mm. there and they wouldn't be here if it wasn't. Um, it's a, it's a daily challenge. That's do you really create the goals or do you do it as a team? Yeah. Well, we've got, you know, I've got obviously goals for the program that I set as a head coach. Um, but in terms of the team's goals, they, they set it themselves. Sometimes I'll facilitate mm. and, mm. um, but I really, I think it should, it should come from the team Yeah, sure. Um, because it, if it comes from the coaches, then they're less likely to buy in. And if it's, if it's their idea and their goals, you know, they're accountable to it. Um, yeah. And so we, sometimes we even remove ourselves from the conversation and just say, Hey, mm. let's talk as a team and figure this out. What's possible for us. And it, you know, this year they set, I think like six or seven really tough goals mm. and they reached every single one of them. Wow. That's wow. amazing. And so I was just, it's really powerful when you can get the team to take ownership of, of it in that way. Interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. I think even, um, I know right now we're also talking through, um, inclusion and what does that look like from, you know, each store, each team, um, how do you include those around you into those decisions that you're making? And have you, have you noticed of the goals that your team has kind of set, whether it was kind of just themselves congregating and figuring out this is what we can do as a team. And this is how we're going to include everyone. Have their goals been um, a bit loftier than maybe if you were in on that conversation, are they reaching a bit higher? Um, what does that look like? Well, I always start by, I'm sure everybody has heard this acronym of like smart goals and they yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. Measurable and attainable and whatever <laughs> the whole rest of the thing is. We usually start start by explaining that. So they, they sort of know going into it, like we've got to set goals that are maybe a tiny bit out of our reach. We feel they're a little Mm -hmm. bit out of our reach, but we, but it's still realistic. It's still within the realm of possibility. And my biggest thing is like, you have to be specific about your goals because if it's too vague, you give yourself an out. You Mm -hmm. know, I even challenge my athletes and I'll I'll say, okay, what do you want to work on today on beam? They say, I want to work on my, on my series. I'm like, great. What does that look like? Oh, I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to do a few. How many? And Mm -hmm. it's three, how many without wobbles? And I try to get them to be super specific so that, um, real into it. Yeah. And it's, and it's measurable and, uh, it's just, it creates more accountability that way. And so I love the smart goals and, um, I feel like all our three brains are going crazy right now, but um, <laughs> I just, I try to give them the tools and then let them kind of run with it and figure it out as a team. Cause they're all, I mean, they're all adults and, you know, in reality, they're college students and this That's is right. all a way that we can teach them how to approach life after college and after gymnastics. When, when you look back or, you know, you have a long time, you're early in your career as, as a coach. Um, but even at the end of the year, you, you talked about, you do this, you know, gymnastics is the vehicle for you to make a difference in people's lives. What do you hope your athletes say about you uh, once they graduate? Um, you know, the biggest thing is there, I mean, I could say a million things, um, but I think the number one thing, if they had to say anything at all, it would be that, you know, I, I helped them grow and I pushed mm-hmm. them, to, I pushed them to reach their potential. And I mean that not just with gymnastics, but yeah, sure. as a human being as well. Um, you know, we do a lot of team discussions, but we also do a lot of one-on-one and mm-hmm. then periodically throughout the year where we have them come in and check in on how they're doing. And mm-hmm. I try to encourage them to lead the conversation instead of me just talking at them. Um, and so my goal for them in their four years is to help them really find their voice. And so, so they can say, you know, she pushed me to, to my potential and she helped me find yeah. my voice. Like to me, that, that is what I want to do, you know, aside from any gymnastics accomplishments. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah. You know, in, in leaders or as a coach, um, what's so unique about it is, you know, what you do in your, your day job is actually making a difference in people's, people's lives. And when they go home, and for us, people go home and they have dinner with their families, what are they saying about you, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, are you making them a better person? Um, are you leading them the right way? Or are you being somebody who you come, oh, I can't stand that person, uh, my boss, da, 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 da. Like you determine that as a leader. You can determine... Um, how they perceive themselves in a big portion of their life, um, which is a pretty 
it's a pretty cool responsibility. Uh, you know, I think that we all have. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So it sounds like you had a uh, pretty good year. Um, were you happy with how it turned out? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. oh my gosh, I was just doing an interview before this talking about um, the whole interview is about from the moment the season got canceled in 2020 yeah. till now the whole yeah. process and how COVID impacted. And there was just this whole layer of COVID that, um, you know, changed the way we did things this year. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, you know, they were able to overcome all this COVID adversity and, you know, be even more successful as a team and break all these program records. And I literally was telling whoever was interviewing me that those two things are connected. Um, you know, having to, uh, make adjustments and, um, adapt to a different way of doing things this year, Mm -hmm. challenge our whole team to kind of flex their resilience muscle. Um, and you know, my whole goal with COVID wasn't to go around and say like, don't do this, don't socialize with that person, pull up Mm -hmm. your mask, like social distance. It was, you know, giving them the tools and information of why it's all important to do those things. Um, so that it becomes their choice and they take ownership of that. Um, and they did it. They, they took on that challenge of we're going to make it through a season without any COVID interruptions and this, and we're doing it because it's, it's important and that's the right thing to do. Um, and then because they were empowered in that area of their lives, Mm -hmm. I think it allowed them to be even better athletes this year. Interesting. Um, I think when you're empowered and, you know, becoming more confident in one area of life, it definitely bleeds into another area of life. Um, and so I, I think that's what we saw this year. And, you know, we had a really successful year, uh, reaching all of our, all of the team's goals. And we've still, we're, we're kind of on this upward trajectory as a, yeah. as a program. Yeah. Um, it looks like it. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. So I was really proud of the team this year. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's incredible. I, and speaking to well being and how pouring into one aspect of someone's life can also, uh, you know, reap benefits in other areas. Um, how have you been able to kind of balance everything that's been going on in your life, but then also helping your, your athletes balance what's going on in their lives? Because they've got a lot going on. You have a lot going on. You both have goals that you're trying to attain that are, <clears throat> you know, on that forefront for all of you. How are you kind of looking out for your well being and your team's well being too? I mean, one of my big philosophies um, as a coach is that, you know, we talk about leadership and I believe it's, it's my job to model leadership. And, mm-hmm. you know, if, we, if I know anything, it's like my team is watching the way I show up, the way I lead, they're listening, they're taking all that in good or bad. They're even with our, you know, we've got a coaching staff of, of four coaches and they, they sense if we're not in alignment, mm-hmm. they sense if, if drama is going on. And so, Um, you know, my thing is if I can show up for myself and be the best version of Jordan and the best leader that I can be, the team's going to pick up on that and they're going to start noticing. So I just, I have this philosophy that if I want our team to show up one way, I got to make sure I'm showing up. Um, I'm showing up that way as well. And it's, it's all the way down to little daily habits. Like I ask them to be on time. Guess what? I'm going to be on time every single day. Um, I ask them to communicate effectively. Guess what? I've got to model that first. Mm. Um, so that's kind of how, you know, I would answer that question is just, you know, I try to model what I want to see out of, of student athletes, although they have a very different job than I do. Um, I think it starts with the leadership and then, you know, hopefully we can empower, you know, groups of leaders on our team. Um, and that legacy just kind of gets um, shifted to that, that group of leaders every year. Yeah. Do, do you have any um, routines or things that you do? Obviously, you you go from a probably a pretty strict routine uh, growing up. Uh, how's that translated into just everyday life on how you take care of yourself? Um, you know, it's it's changed a lot over the last yeah, sure. few years um, with you know the busyness of this job. Mm. Um, but I've also learned that you know I can't show up for other people unless I'm taking care of myself yeah. and. I'll, my, my brain and my heart sometimes just wants to go, go, go and work, work, work all the time. (laughs) Uh, I literally have to force myself sometimes to leave the office to go get lunch. I'm like, okay, I need to go get lunch. I could sit here and like answer all my emails and continue working, but it's important that I take care of myself and same Mm -hmm. goes with working out and same goes with leaving the office at a decent time. Um, and really just 
you know, it's always going to be in my personality to work harder than everybody else and try to push the limits of what I think is sure. possible for myself in, in this program. Um, but I also know that, um, I have, I have a life to live and, um, that that balance is important for my mental health too. Um, so it's, it looked a little different over the years. You know, when I lived in LA, I was, I worked out like crazy. I loved soul cycle and fairies boot camp and all these mm. things. And, and now out here I do a little less of the working out and cause I have to spend more time working. Um, but just in general, like I, I try to get out and walk my dog every day and just kind of take that mental, mental break from work when, because it, it allows me to come back even more refreshed. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then I build in, I build in that lesson, even with our team, I actually give them, I call them PDs, they're called personal days. Mm. And every semester they get two PDs. And, um, and I build that in because as human beings, sometimes we just need a day. And yes. you don't have to be sick. You don't have to be stuck in bed or whatever. It's like, you know, there's some days you just need to catch up on laundry yeah. or a yeah. little extra time studying or just go to a coffee shop and sit. And mm. so they literally, they get to text me in the morning and say, Hey, I'm taking a PD today and no questions asked. I, I just say, okay, enjoy your day. Um, mm-hmm. And they just get to have their day because I know if they need it, they're going to come back the next day, even more refreshed. That's great. They come in Absolutely. And so, That's great. um, we try to build that lesson in as well. That's cool. great. Um, a lot of new leaders out there um, that are probably wrestling. They're about nine months into role, wrestling with did I make the right decision? You know, um, I took this role on. It's a big jump for me. Mm-hmm. Um, would you have any advice for um, somebody who's new to leadership uh, on how you would either motivate them or just you know, encourage them uh, through their journey? Yeah. Yeah. I mean that what you're talking about is something that I still struggle, still struggle with and probably will continue to struggle with for the rest of my career of, um, you know, having to make a lot of decisions every day that mm-hmm. impact a lot of people. And then so- sort of that anxiety afterwards of, did I make, make the, the right, right call? call? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I just keep in the forefront of my mind is, you know, was it in the best interest of the student athlete? And do I believe it is the best thing for, for them? Um, and if I can, if it has to do with my student athletes and I can answer that question with yes, then um, I try to just be okay with whatever feeling I have post a decision. But um, the other thing I remind myself is I'm never, especially being young and early on in my career, I'm not going to have all the answers. Mm. Um, and I'm never going to, I'm never going to know what the mm. right decision is all of the time. Um, and that's okay. And yep. it's all a learning process. And if I make the wrong decision, then I, I better make sure I learn from it and then make the right one the next time something similar yep. comes up. And, um, and it's not that I say that, that like it's easy, but it's not, um, it's, it's hard, especially when you, when you work and manage with a lot of people yep. and you're not going to please everyone ever. Um, mm-hmm. you might please some people and, and other times not, but, yeah, sure. um, yeah. It's hard, especially when you make a lot of decisions, but if you can, at the end of the day, just, you know, look at the people that you're, you're making decisions and it's affecting them and just say, you know, do I believe this is the right thing? Um, and if you can say yes, then, then you just got to be okay with it and, and just keep moving forward. Yeah. You know, I, um, it's, it's interesting you say that one of the things I think about is, can you look in the mirror at the end of the day and say, Hey, I made the, the right decisions, uh, that took care of the people that work for me. And for us, our customers. And as long as you look through it in that lens and it's not self-serving decisions, your ego is not getting in the way, you're not doing it to spite somebody, but you're making the decision based on what you feel is the best for the people that work around you and for us, our customers, uh, you're going to be okay. You're going to make pretty close to the right decision. It may not always be right, but as long as you have the right motives, um, you're typically laying in the right place um, and you have some integrity uh, that you can lean back on, which is great. Yeah, you said that a lot more eloquently than I did, but that's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> that's awesome. That was great. Jordan, I, I just want to say thank you for your time. Uh, you know, you're clearly making a difference uh, with your athletes, and I know that it's so refreshing to hear that that is your motivation, uh, that you really want to make, you want to win, you want to be competitive, but you really want to make a difference in people's lives, and uh, I'm sure you're doing that in spades. So thank you so much for your time and uh you know maybe at some point we can connect in other ways but uh thank you uh thank you again it's been a pleasure yeah absolutely thanks for having me it was a great conversation yep good stuff thank you so much thank you so much